I'm David Haynes. I'm opinions editor at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And we're joined today by Mary Bell, who's the president of the Wisconsin Education Association Council, WEAC, the state's largest teachers union. Mary, welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for being with us. You came in to talk to the editorial board today about a new school accountability process in which WEAC is a part. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about the forums that you've held around the state and what you learned. Sure, absolutely. Uh, last summer, uh, when we declined, along with the American Federation of Teachers in Wisconsin, uh, to participate in the governor's school accountability task force, what we committed to instead was going around the state in order to hold uh, a series of conversations, both with our members and with the community and parents across the state, um, to gather their information about what they saw as critical issues in knowing what their schools do and how well they do it. Let me ask you uh, just briefly to explain for viewers who aren't aware, why did you decline? Well, we really believed that uh, what ha had been uh, happening over the course of the first six months of the year um, indicated that the governor was not necessarily receptive to hearing the voice of unions in terms of the representation of educators and what was really important to us. This issue was too important for us to ignore or too important for us to say we were going to be discounted. What we wanted to do was make sure that the voice of people was heard um, in a way that allowed them to gather really valuable information on a critical issue for our schools. So you declined and you've sort of gathered your own information? Well, it wasn't just from the us. Forms. We went out to the public to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an independent facilitator, so it was not something that was led by WEAC in this place. Uh, but we did sponsor these forums in order to gather information on a variety of topics that we think the task force needs to deal with. Um, today, we are uh, delivering that report to the state mm -hmm. superintendent. Uh, and I believe that the task force will be getting those copies at their meeting tomorrow. And so uh, there were eight forums around the state. Yes. They included teachers, parents, some community leaders, politicians, mm -hmm. some of the media came. Can you summarize very briefly the five points that uh, came out of those forums that you're recommending? Sure. The first is not a surprise. The recommendation was that we need some kind of holistic measures of school accountability. We need to look at overall the opportunities that we provide our students across the state, uh, regardless of what size of school district they work in and live in, um, regardless of the circumstances, they need to be provided some basic opportunities to learn, things like art and music, technology and career education, uh, that they need to be provided options in foreign languages because we know what those things provide to them. We also need to know that the evaluation of our educators and their professional development are linked in a way that they haven't traditionally been. So that when we get information about how someone is doing in the classroom, uh, that that's linked to professional development, which improves the school and it improves everything about student achievement So if you find school. a teacher for, who for whatever reason might not be performing up to the highest level, that could trigger some kind of development or some kind of coaching. Well, and that you have some sense of what it is that's not working. To say that okay. someone isn't performing doesn't give them any information about how to be better or what it is they're lacking. That specifically can be done. Exactly, okay. and then you design the professional development to help encourage um, a better performance from that individual. What are some of the other points on your list? Sure. Other factors that are involved um, besides opportunity to learn involve a lot of intangibles that don't necessarily get measured. School climate is a huge one that makes a difference. The leadership and the climate of a school make a huge difference in student achievement and parents, community members wanted to feel that when they went into a building and the stability of the educators in a building is tied to a positive school climate where they believe they're being rewarded and awarded the kind of respect that they deserve uh, for doing the job. And that school they do. climate can be measured how? Through a survey process? There, there are a variety of surveys and there okay. are measures that can be done. Uh, some states have taken the lead in this. It's not been something that's traditionally been done in a lot of districts in Wisconsin. I remember Alan Borsick, who worked for the paper for a number of years, is at Marquette now, used to say that when he walked at hundreds of schools over the course of his career, he would say that you do get a feel as soon as you walk into a school. That seems like a hard thing to measure. How do, you, how do you do that? Well, these assessments are very, very clear, and they go to teachers as well as parents, as well as community members who interact with the school. 
Um, what we hear anecdotally from parents and community members when they talk to us uh, is that you know when you walk into a school because there's student artwork on the walls. You right. know when you walk into a school that students are not, you know, uniformly moving through or they're not chaotic any more than students are ever chaotic because right. it is a school after all, but they're actually enjoying being there, they're moving, they're friendly, they interact, they actually talk to you as you come into a school, that it's not a place where people are afraid or inhibited, they actually do the work um, that we think schools are engaged in, which is training for the future citizens, people who interact and, and uh, care about other people. There, there are just some elements of that that you can get from student surveys um, pretty quickly. Okay. What else are you recommending? Okay, I'm going to quickly look at my notes because, okay, of course, I don't have them all five <laughs> memorized. But um, just hit the highlights the, the, for the key indicators of school quality, things that, that come up in every conversation that I have um, but came up very clearly in the forum, they're concerned about class sizes. Not because there's a magic number for class size, but they believe overall when you don't pay attention to that key measure of quality, there's a loss for students in terms of individual attention and the kind of learning that they have. Um, the availability of student support programs. We know that because of budget cuts in a lot of places, guidance and social work services have been cut back. Uh, because they don't affect the classroom size mm -hmm. number um, and they aren't measured in any particular assessment. But what we know is if students have needs that are being unaddressed, um, they cannot be effective learners in the classroom and so classroom performance is going to suffer and the overall climate of the school suffers if you have students whose needs aren't being addressed that way. They tend to act out more, they tend to create more discipline problems. Those are things that people mm -hmm. are concerned about and they want to see addressed. Um, Specific criteria is another area for non-tested subject areas. All of the things that they know are important, that they want to see in an opportunity to learn environment that aren't necessarily part of a WKCE exam, even mm -hmm. the new exams that are being developed in reading and science and math. So how do we judge what a quality art or music program is? How do we judge a quality foreign language program? Um, it's more than an evaluation of the educators. What does the program provide? What resources, what opportunities, um, and how many opportunities are there? They want a school district, a school to be judged based on what they really offer to students as well as the results that come so out of the So you're looking for end. a more holistic approach. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Um, let's, let's move on to mm -hmm. another topic. Uh, you've had kind of a wild ride in <laughs> Madison over the past 11 months. That's what's an that, understatement. What, what's that been like for you? You've been right in the middle of it. Um, it has been uh, exhilarating to see people respond. It has been um, challenging and disheartening in many ways to see a government and a, a state that I value uh, put the things that I value and that I believe Wisconsin citizens value at such risk. Um, from challenging the very voice of educators in their school districts with, through their union um, to budget cuts that I think are devastating uh, to what schools need to provide, particularly in a challenging economy. Um, education has always been seen as the route forward. Mm -hmm. um, and to make these cuts at this time uh, seems not only extreme, but it, it's following an agenda I just can't believe in. Now we, we act, not surprisingly, as leading a recall effort against Governor Walker. Um, this newspaper has argued that the recalls are essentially a distraction because it's over a policy issue. And we've argued over one policy issue. Why don't you tell us why you think we're wrong? Well, I, think it, I think it's broader than one policy issue. Okay. I think it is a basic approach that has said that we're going to hold those who are least able to provide uh, for themselves, children, the elderly, um, the people who are still learning to be Wisconsin solid citizens, uh, holding them accountable for an economic policy or an economic condition they didn't create. Um, I think that it approaches things from a blaming rather than a building perspective, mm -hmm. and I think they have attacked the basic building blocks of what Wisconsin has valued in terms of its citizens' voices. You're talking about education, schools? Uh, education, right. I'm talking okay. about voter ID, I am talking about the okay. cuts to Medicaid. Um, there are social support services that are critical. There are so many ways in which this administration, um, the governor and the lieutenant governor, have 
really discounted what citizens have told them are important programs and important protections um, that I think they are really deserving of recall, and that's why we're, we're behind but, but it. But do you really think that this recall effort would have any steam behind it if it wasn't for Act 10, which um, led to the uh, uh, curtailment of many union rights for, for uh, public workers? I, I think that $1.6 billion cuts from public schools uh, would get the attention of Wisconsin citizens with or without Act 10. The fact that it was accompanied by and said that the 1.6 would be okay because of that Act 10, uh, that was just adding insult to injury. And w what's the reaction been? Taxpayers may well get bills in December that show either a flat tax increase or a decline in some cases. How do you make that argument for taxpayers that you should recall Governor Walker? when in fact, from their point of view, from that at least narrow point of view, things might look okay? I don't think Wisconsin citizens look at only their tax bill as their okay. quality of life. And I think that that's what we're going to find through the recall petition efforts, and that's what we'll find moving into the spring. Mary Bell, thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we really we're gratified to be able to deliver this report in what we think is a timely fashion. And that's coming out today. It is coming out okay. today um, because the work of the Accountability Task Force was important. We said that from the beginning, but we've honored our commitment to be a part of that work, even though we felt it was important not to be on the task force itself. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you.